Hello friends, welcome to ML with AP. This is the third video of the series of videos where we are discussing support vector machine. In first video, we discussed with maximal margin classifier. We have also seen the intuition and maths behind soft margin classifier and support vector classifier. We also saw the regular uh, L1 regularization and the C hyperparameter. We saw the complete math. In the second video, we saw something which was super important, the kernel trick and the support vector machine intuition and what we mean by kernel trick. If you have not watched my previous two videos, I highly recommend you to go ahead and watch. This particular video will make much more sense if you have seen the other two. Now in this particular video, what we are going to do is we are going to use scikit-learn to, um, to code SVM. So without further ado, let's do some coding. Let's jump on to Jupyter Notebook. Okay. So I have, I have already opened my Jupyter Notebook over here. The first thing we should do is we should import our libraries, right? That's the first thing. Let's import our libraries. Okay. Now I'm using a scikit-learn data set to make the blobs or to make, to generate this data. I'm not using any, any, any existing data. I'm, I'm mocking up the data, right? So it has a very good method or library, which is make blobs. You can pass that how many data points you need, how many clusters you need and all those things. And it will generate the data for you. And I'm plotting it in a scatter plot, right? So I have, as you can see, this is a binary classification problem. I have red dots and yellow dots, right? I've generated. This looks like linearly separable to me. So we do not have to use the kernels, polynomial kernel and all and transform this into a higher dimension. Probably we should be able to draw a line over here. Let's see whether we are able to draw a line. Okay, so what I've done over here is I'm trying to draw few lines over here just to give you the intuition behind how the SVM or the SVC works, right? Maximal margin classifier. So what I've done is nothing but I have specified the M and uh, the two parameters, the intercept and the slope of various lines and I've tried to draw the line. So if you see some of the lines like this, this, are, this is doing a good job, right? So which of these lines are better? Like this slanting line, this line, this line, which line is doing a better job of it? That depends on that, how thick or wide the road you want to make. What was our maximal margin or support uh, vector classifier goal? It was to make the maximum margin or the road should be the thick. Even if there are little misclassification, that's fine. But to gain generalization or to, to have the better bias variance trade-off, we should make the road thicker, right? Okay, so this is, this is what the intuition is. Let's see our x variable and we have got the y variable over here, right? So I've got the x and y variable. It's a binary classification. So in y, you will see only zero and ones, right? Now let's do the train, use the train test to split and split our test data in uh, our data into train and test size, right? So I'm using the 20% test size and we'll convert this into x train, x test, y train, y test. Now, friends, if you recall from my first video, I always said that, that you have to use, uh, you have to scale your data or you have to do feature scaling to get good result from the um, SVM. So we are using the standard scaler. What a standard scaler will do? It, the formula, if you recall, it is X minus mu by sigma, right? So the new transform variable will be X minus mu. Mu is your uh, mean of the data set and sigma <clears throat> is the standard deviation of that. So what we are doing is we are by subtracting mu, we are zero centering our mu of this data, right? So our, we are moving the mu of the data to zero and by dividing by sigma, what we are doing, we are standardizing it. By standardizing means that if you know about the Gaussian, normal Gaussian, curve, a standard uh, normal curve, it has a mu of zero, it is centered, the mu is centered around zero, and we have the sigma of one, or the standard deviation of one. We are doing the same thing. We are trying to make the standard deviation, this particular data set one, and we are centering mu to zero. Okay, this is what a standard scalar does, right? So in, just to give you a background in normalization, we can do multiple things, like normalization is like feature scaling. A standard scalar or a standardization is one of the 
tricks, right? You can al also do min max scalar, which what it will do is that it will squish the data between max and min value, right? Okay, so it will squish the data between zero to one all the max and min value. So that is another technique of a scaling. A standard scaler works perfectly well for most of the scenarios wherever machine learning models need a, uh, a scale down or, a, or feature scaling features, right? So I'm just doing a standard scaler over here and I have transformed my edge train and edge test data, okay? Now, if you recall over here, another interesting thing is I did a fit transform and second thing, I did a transform. Can one of you pause the video and uh, can you think that why I've, I'm doing a fit transform here, here and only transform over here? The answer lies is that in scikit-learn, there is a method which is fit transform. So when you do, you can do a fit and then transform also. But instead of that, you can club both of them and you can do a fit transform. By doing fit and transform, based on this edge strain, I'm calculating my mu and sigma. And then I'm scaling my edge strain based on that mu and sigma. But over here, for my test data, I do not want to calculate mu and sigma. Whatever transformation I have done on my test train data, I want to run the same transformation on my test data. Correct? If I do a different transformation on test data, these two data will become disparate. They will be completely differently transformed. I do not want that. So I will learn my mu and sigma for a standard scalar with edge strain. I'll do the transformation of edge strain using that identified mu and sigma. And then I'll only do transformation and edge test. That's why if somebody asks you that why there is a fit transform for train while well, there is just a transform for test, that is the reason. Okay. Anyway, that is a little aside, but let's move on. What I will do is I will use a kernel which is linear because I thought that this data is linearly separable. I will use the kernel linear and I will start with the hyperparameter C regularization parameter or penalty as 0.01. And let me calculate the accuracy score for that. Okay, for my test. <clears throat> accuracy score came 100% one, very good. Okay, let me, let me do the same thing with a RBF kernel. RBF is another kernel, radial basis function. Okay, let me do that. Sometimes the model is accuracy came only 0.7, right? Because the data was already linearly separable over here. The, my accuracy has gone down, right? So it didn't need it to do, uh, if I do a polynomial kernel, let's say over here, my accuracy has come to 0 0.76. So the usage of whether you have to use linear kernel, RBF, poly, what sort of C you have to opt for, right? What sort of penalty or regularization you have to use for? All these are hyperparameters. And friends, you know how do we do in hyperparameters? Cross-validation. Yes, we do either grid search or randomized search cross-validation. And for each of the individual data set, we'll arrive at the correct value of these hyperparameters, right? Okay, let me just show you if I tweak this hyperparameter from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1, let's say what happens. Immediately for RBF kernel also, the accuracy became 1.0, right? So how you will arrive? This is just a simple example, but how you'll actually arrive? You'll do a cross validation, right? With a grid search or randomized search CV, you can do it through sklearn itself, right? Now over here, what I'm trying to do, and this is, this is a, code which I have taken from the internet and it just prints, it just sketches or outputs the graph in a very neat way. I wanted to show you over here. One thing which I wanted to show for our SVC classifier, only the support vectors are important, right? Suppose if I put more data points on the left side of the support vectors or on the right side for the yellow ones, Will it change my margins? Will it change the thickness of the road? No, it will not change. So instead of N60 or 120, because my support vector is the only thing which determines, which determines my thickness of the road, right? Or the margins, any data point beyond the support vectors doesn't matter. This is what I wanted to show you. 
okay now let's see <clears throat> some data which is not linearly separable okay some data which is not linearly separable so i will use the make circle method and let me draw it okay so this data was not linearly separable and what i was trying to do i was trying to fit a linear kernel <clears throat> I'm trying to fit it without doing transformation into higher dimension. I'm trying to fit a line. Is it doing a good job? No, it's doing a horrible job, right? You can see it. Okay, let's see. Let me use the polynomial kernel for once. Okay, with C, I will just randomly start with some value of C over here. Let me start this. And then I'm plotting in two dimension how it will look like. So when I plotted my polynomial kernel or the hyperplane, into a lower dimension or a two dimension. This is what the polynomial kernel will look like, right? Friends, if you see the dotted are the margin, right? The thicker line are the absolute boundaries, right? But it is able to do some sort of good job in separating this red from the yellow ones, right? And again, you can predict the accuracy similarly like how we are predicting the accuracy and all those things. The other thing which we should see is that suppose if their data is like something like this, which is kind of jumbled up, there is no like really um, uh, right margin to separate the data linearly, right? Okay, but we will try to use the linear kernel over and inside and see that if by allowing misclassification, which is the basis of softening the margin or the soft margin classifier, let's say if we are able to do it, okay? Again, over here, I'm plotting this, our support vectors, right? So for C for 10 and C, with this is what I wanted to show you, that the hyperparameter C, when the hyperparameter is higher, what I'm asking my model to do, I'm asking my model to be very strict with misclassifications, okay? And fit the data very, very well, okay? So the thinner, the road will become thinner, misclassifications will be very very low right it is the case of a high variance the data is fitting well to the observed data but will it generalize well if the new data set comes or a new point comes no it will not be able to generalize well right because it has a high variance and low bias if i reduce it to c to 0 0.1 what will happen over here what will happen as you can see it is allowing few of the data points to come into the road right come into the middle of the road it will also allow you to do misclassification but it will gain what it will gain generalization it is a case on the right side it is a case of low variance high bias okay low variance high bias case and friends you know that in low variance high bias case generalization is more the newer data set the unobserved data which will come it will be able to will gain the predictive power it will there are more chances that we'll be able to predict it correctly okay than particular over here okay so friends this was the support vector machine i hope you got all the intuitions and the code i will link this jupyter notebook also into the description below if you have any doubt or any questions i thought i tried to cover most of these things in the three-part video series if you still have any doubt, please feel free to write in the comment below and I will immediately answer that. Okay, I check all my comments. I will try to answer if you have or if you have any more suggestions that probably I missed some topics. Um, you, you can write in the comment. I will try to do that. Uh, with that being said, let me stop it over here. And I do have a favor to ask you. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please do so. Thank you and have a great day. I'll see you in the next video.